Bible, when you read the Word of God, you'll see God always putting his people through a series of tests in order to grow their faith. In fact, in the Old Testament, when you look in the Old Testament, you'll see that when, when God called Abraham and told Abraham, I've called you and I want you to leave your, your, your country, leave your countrymen, and I want you to go to a place that I am sending you to. And Abraham didn't even know where he was going. But God was ready to birth himself a nation, a people. And therefore called Abraham to leave his country, leave his town, leave his family, and go to where God was sending him. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 to 10, the Bible says this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of, with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations and whose builder and maker is God. How many know that took faith? By faith, Abraham moved. And by faith, he left his countrymen to go to the place where God was calling him. When you look in Exodus, when God called the children of Israel, and delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, amen, what could have just been a few days' journey to God's promised land that he promised to, those, to the children of Israel, he took them the way of the wilderness, in other words, the longer way. And he did that for the reason of testing them, of growing their faith. They needed to grow their faith and therefore took them to the way of the wilderness, and the wilderness was a wilderness of testing, of, of, of them growing in the area of trusting who God is, who God called him, believing God and believing his promise, believing his provision and believing him for his protection. In fact, right when God delivered them out of Egypt, right, the first test that they experienced just right out of Egypt was the Red Sea. How many remember that test? Amen. And it was a test of God's promise. In other words, God told him, I promised you a land that flows with milk and honey. Even though you're in bondage right now, even though you're in a struggle, you're being oppressed. But now is the time that I'm going to come and I'm going to pull you out of your struggle. I'm going to deliver you by my strong arm. And I'm going to bring you into a land that you can raise your children. You can be blessed. A land of promise. And all of a sudden, God delivers them. And now they're right here by the Red Sea. But all of a sudden, Pharaoh's army begins to come and to, wanting to take them back to Egypt. And their backs are up against the wall. You could imagine their question in their mind, what happened to God's promise? It was a test. The test of God's promise. And you know as well as I know, God opened up that Red Sea. Amen? Because God is always faithful to his promise. Amen? It was a test. Everybody say test. Not only the test of God's promise, but also the test of God's provision. I mean, think about it. Going out into the wilderness, how are you going to eat? Amen? How are they going to eat? What are they going to eat? All these people. How are all these people going to eat in the desert? Right? Well, it was a test. It was a test of God's provision. And you know as well as I know, once they stepped in there, God says, I will provide. Amen. If you're my people and I'm your God, you just put your trust in me and I'll provide everything you need. And God provided manna from heaven. God provided food from heaven. It was a test of God's provision so that later on they will believe that God will supply all their needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen the test then there was another test amen the test of God's protection when they went through the wilderness how many know in the wilderness there's a lot of wild animals out there right and also there's a long so on that journey there's a lot of other pagan uh, tribes and different fierce life like tribes amen that would want to try and take them out but we know that every battle that they faced, God was faithful and God protected him and God gave him victory because that's who God is. Amen. If God called you, he will provide for you. If God called you, amen, he will protect you. Amen. Because it's his promise. Somebody say amen. amen. But it was all a test. All of these were lessons of faith so that when they got to the promised land, they knew their God. And if God promised them this land, even though the enemy has possession, amen, 
And if God promised them unbroken victory, if God promised them that wherever their feet would, would touch, that they would see success, then all they had to do was believe it. All they had to do was believe the integrity of God's word because if he was faithful yesterday, he'll be faithful today, and he'll be faithful tomorrow. Amen? They were all lessons of faith so that they can be effective in receiving their promise. Now here in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, we find Jesus giving his disciples a lesson in faith. By putting them to the test in order to grow that faith. Because how many know that if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, and if we're going to be able to, to weather the storms of life and family and ministry on this journey, if you and I are going to be effective in the advancement of the kingdom of God all over the world, then how many know it's going to take great faith? I said it's going to take great faith. Amen? Amen. If we're going to see God be God and fulfill every promise in our life, we're going to need great faith. Amen? And faith is the key. I'm telling you, faith is the key for this miracle month. Faith is the key for whatever you're facing right now in your life. Faith is the key. If you have a financial need and you need a financial breakthrough, faith is the key. If you need God protection, God's provision, amen, or you need healing in your body, you need a deliverance, whatever it is you're praying for, faith is the key. Faith is what gives the believer victory and makes him successful. Faith is the most powerful weapon in the life of the believer. Faith is the most powerful defensive weapon and offensive weapon. Without faith, we're dead men. This is how important faith is. And if you don't understand, see, Jesus even told Peter one time, he told him this. Peter, because of your call, in, in essence, because of who you are and what I've called you to do and the plans that I have for you, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. In other words, the devil wants to take you out, Peter. How many know the devil would love to take VOSB out? Oh, he's tried all these years. Uh, we've been through some battles. We've been through some valleys. We've been through some fights. But how many know we're still standing? Amen. Some of you, amen, you've been through some stuff. The devil threw everything he got, he had against you. But you're still here and you're still standing. You know why? Because of your faith. He said the devil has desired to take you out Peter but Jesus said this I've been praying for you Peter I've been praying for you Peter and you know what Jesus' prayer was it's not that he would never make another mistake it's not that he might never make an, another stumble but that his faith would not fail <laughs> lessons of faith what is faith faith is believing it's simply trusting God, believing and trusting God for all of your needs and all of your circumstances and all of your situations. Whatever you go through in this journey with God, in the kingdom of God, if God has called you, if God has separated, if God has a plan, and he does for each and every one of us. And in order to be victorious and be able to fulfill that plan and purpose and continue to move forward towards our promise, it's going to take great faith. It's going to take believing, trusting in God for all of your needs, all of your circumstances, and all of your situations. See, when it comes to trusting God, we must trust in three facts. Number one, we must trust in the fact that God is an omniscient God. What does that mean? That means that God is an all-knowing God. There's nothing that God doesn't know. He's God. He's creator, right? He's everywhere. Right? And there's nothing that he doesn't know. And if that is true, then, that, then we have to understand that as a believer, then God knows all about our life. He knows everything about us. In fact, he knows exactly where you are, where you've been, what you've done. He knows exactly what you're going through right now, what battle you're facing right now, what trial you're facing, what tribulation you're facing, what testing you're facing, what temptation you're facing. He knows all about it because God is an omniscient God. And if that is true, not only does he know exactly what you're going through, what you're facing, but he also knows how he's going to give you the victory, how he's going to get you through it, how he's going to provide, how. Because God is an all-knowing God. He's omniscient, and we must trust in that fact. The second thing we must 
trust in the fact. Second fact is that God is omnipotent. What does that mean? That means that God is an all-powerful God. He never runs out of power. He's always full of power. Amen. Because he's God. Amen. He who comes to God, the Bible says, must believe that he is God. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. The Bible says what may be impossible for you and what may be impossible for man or what the doctor say is impossible or what the lawyer says is impossible or whoever says impossible is possible with God. God, because God is all powerful. The Bible says there is nothing too hard, nothing too hard, nothing too hard for God. And then the third thing, in fact, we must trust in it is the fact that God is immutable. What does that mean? That means that God never changes. He says, I change not. Amen. He never changes. In other words, he always remains who he is. He's God. People can tell you this about God. People can say this about God. Your own mind can try and deceive you about God. Amen. The world can try and tell you things about God, but it, it, he is who he is. Amen. He is God. He's still creator. He's still the giver of life, the owner of all things. Amen. He's still God. And he never changes. If God is love, he's full of love. And he never runs out of unconditional love. If God is merciful, he remains merciful. He's always a forgiving God. Can you say amen? If God is just, then he remains just. If God is faithful, he remains faithful. He remains who he is. He does not change. And it's important to understand this fact because no matter what you're facing or what you're going through or what the devil has thrown at you, listen, if Jesus delivered you yesterday, he'll do it again today. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you got to trust in that fact. So keep these facts in mind as we move on in our lesson. So when you look at the story here, you see that Jesus... After the Passover, they had went up to a mountainside. And they were there in that mountainside. And wherever Jesus was going, people, multitudes were following him. The Bible mentions there are 5,000 men, but it doesn't include the, the women or the children that were there. And we see here, there, we see, we see that, that as they were there, that Jesus took advantage of the situation to teach his disciples a lesson in faith. And so what he does, he looks to the first disciple. And who was the first disciple? Philip. Right? Philip was the first disciple. And he asked Philip this question. Where can we buy bread that we can feed all these 5,000 plus people? What a question. And so I imagine, well, actually you kind of just sense reading between the lines. Philip really probably didn't even look at his account. He probably already knew that they didn't have much, amen, because they were living by faith. And so therefore, when Jesus did this, he said, I did this, I asked him this to test him. The way that Philip responded was, there, a, a half a year's wages is not even sufficient, not enough to feed all these people, Jesus. What a question. But see, what happened to Philip is that Philip missed the greatest opportunity to be a part of the miracle of God's provision because he had no faith. Now think about it. He's seen Jesus turn water into wine. He's seen how Jesus healed that nobleman's son. He's seen how Jesus healed that man that was for 38 years. He couldn't walk, and all of a sudden he started walking. And now he is put to the test and Jesus asked him a question, where can we buy bread so we can feed all these people? See, if he would remember Jesus yesterday, he probably would have been able to pass the test today. But because Peter failed to take Jesus into account, rather he looked into his empty account and saw he had nothing. Or if he had anything, it was just a little bit and it wasn't sufficient to be able to feed all those people. And therefore, Philip failed the test. 
He failed the test. Why? Because he didn't take Jesus into account. He forgot that the Son of God, deity, was sitting right next to him. And how many know that happens many times when we're put to the test? Sometimes we look at ourselves, we look at our bank account, we look at this, we look at circumstances, we look at situations, rather than looking at the Savior, looking to Jesus. Amen? Remember that. The next time you're faced with a test, maybe the greatest trial of your life, maybe the doctor said that this is it and this is a, a diagnosis that is incurable. I mean, an impossible situation. Oh, the doctor can say what he wants to say, but I serve the doctor of all doctors, my friend, that always has the last word. Uh, and I can say, okay, thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you for the advice. And usually they give you the worst of the worst. Amen? Because they don't want to put, they want you to know the truth. Okay, that's good. But I know so who is the truth. Amen? The way and the life. And I know that he is still the miracle worker. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you might say this, but what does God say about it? See, Philip failed the test because he was focused more on what he didn't have rather than on what he did have to get. See, it wasn't even the amount that was important. See, this is where a lot of people miss it when, when the, the test comes. The opportunity, the window of opportunity to be a part of the greatest miracle provision that either God may want to provide for you or God may want to provide for somebody else. Usually when the test comes, what happens is we look at what we don't have. Oh, I'd love to be a blessing. I'd like to be a part of that. I want to go to the women's retreat, but... It was a test. You looked at your account rather than taking Jesus into account. Is he still the miracle worker? Huh? Does he still set up kings and tear down kings? Does he still change the chimes and the scene because he's God? You think he can tell that pagan boss to let you go? You think he can't provide for you? You think he can't make a way? You just didn't have the faith to believe and ask. I thought I'd throw that in for you, babe. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Because we want every woman to be blessed. We want every woman to be challenged. We want every woman to hear the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We want every woman to answer the call, feel the call, understand that your life is significant. I don't care what people say, what people say, or what the world is saying. Listen, you matter. God has plans for you. God wants to use you. He wants to make you a good wife. He wants to make you a good parent, a, a good mother. He wants to make you a sharp tool in his hand that he can use in this generation. But you ain't going. You missed it. Maybe today you're going to sign up by faith. <laughs> See, always remember these principles. And when the challenge, if, if God is calling you, if God is moving you, if the opportunity is presented, this is what you got to know it's God. God wants me to go. I don't have it. Let me tell you something. There's times we've done things in this city that we didn't have the money. Remember Common Ground? And then not too long ago, another crusade we did. You know how much those crusades cost? Over 100 grand. Now, when I first started, I didn't think about that. I didn't have 100,000 in the bank account. In fact, we didn't have much. But there was a need. People were dying in our city. Young people were, were covering our streets with their blood. There was a, a, an eruption of warfare, gang warfare, drug warfare. And I would come in and I would hear the reports and they would, I would hear the news. I hear what's happening in our city, in our backyard. And I said, you know what, we got to do something. Amen. Listen, this, this, this is stepping into our territory. The enemy's trying to make a statement. Amen. He's trying to make, you know, he's trying to act like Goliath. He's stepping out into the valley and he's talking loud. Amen. There are all those sirens, all those mother's cries, and all that gunfire. That's the sound of Goliath uh, choosing us on. What are you going to do, Victory Outreach? Steve? What are you going to do, VOSB? Huh? I, I got control of this. I said, no way. I got those ministers together. I said, we got to do 
so what are we going to do, guys? What do, what's your plan? I have, I don't, what do you want to do? I said, okay, we got to do something. It started with a simple little crusade that began to evolve into a big major citywide impact crusade. And I didn't have no money, but I had prayer on my knees. We came every morning at 5 o'clock praying for our city, praying for the violence to stop, praying for, for God to intervene. God, you got to do it. Help us, God. And as we stepped out in faith and started moving, people start getting behind it. You begin to give. Finances begin to come in. And and I don't know how we did it, but we did it. Why? Because of faith. If, if they would have showed me the bill at first, I would have said, well, you know what? Let's just do some rallies. <laughs> but God was in it. So don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Then there's Andrew, right? So when you look at Philip, he failed the test. Missed a great opportunity. Failed to seize the moment. But then all of a sudden, during this whole scene that was going on with, with Philip, Andrew, there was a little boy right by Andrew, somehow was getting his attention and, and telling him, look, I got five barley loaves of bread and two fish. I'll give it to Jesus so he can feed all these people. And so uh, Andrew, probably not even thinking about it, just grabbed it and started coming to Jesus. This is where you see, as you read the scriptures, like, like an ounce of faith. Like, like some, there was faith active right there for a moment. Probably, you know, all of a sudden the boy came and, and there's a scene and, and he says, I hear, I have this. And he grabbed it and he went to Jesus. He says, Look, Lord, Lord, there's a boy here that has five, five body loaves of bread and two small fish. You, you sense the, the faith, you sense the excitement, you sense the expectation. But then all of a sudden it changed. It's like he stopped and, and, and realized what is he saying? And he said, but what are they among so many? Andrew almost passed the test. He almost passed the test. But something happened. What happened? Somehow, some way, as he was moving in faith with expectation, doubt set in. He started to doubt or oh, human reason started to set in. And I see this happening a lot of times when, when God moves and, and there's an atmosphere like this and things are beginning to happen. And many times we, we feel pumped up and we've been singing the songs and, and God is being glorified in song and we're hearing the testimonies and, and all these different, and, and our faith starts to get activated and, and, and we start to, to rise up with, with expectation, amen, and, and believe. Uh, and as soon as we leave or as soon as we leave your seats, uh, there's something that happens. The devil comes and puts doubt in your mind or all of so you start to think of, wait a minute, what a, you know, can that really, ha no, that can't happen. You know, the, people don't know where I've been or what I've done or what I'm doing or, or they, doubt. Something happened to Andrew. Doubt or human reason or maybe intimidation. Maybe the disciples intimidate him. He started moving in faith and they started looking at him with that evil look of doubt. What's the matter with you? I mean, people have a way of trying to intimidate your faith. You get excited. You get moved. You're ready to step out of the box. Amen. I mean, you're ready to break out of your prison. You say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being stuck over here. I want to do something for God. And all of a sudden, people try and intimidate your faith. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is calling us, VOSB, to be a church of faith, to believe God for the supernatural, to believe uh, that God is able to raise up this humble church to be a global impacting church. Somebody say amen. amen. Not only does God want us to reach our city, he wants us to reach the world. How many believe that? But we have to be a people of faith. We cannot allow doubt or human reason or intimidation or our circumstance or situation to hold us back, VOSB. 
You can't let it hold us back. What you're going through right now. What you're facing right now. What your bank account looks like right now. Don't look at those things. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Somebody say amen. amen. Ecclesiastics chapter 11, verse 4 says this. It says, he who observes the wind will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. In other words, if you look at your circumstances and your situations around you that may seem negative, you're never going to sow. And if you don't say, sow, you're never going to reap. You can't reap something you don't sow. Right? You can go out to your backyard and say, you know what, I want to plant a garden. I want tomatoes, I want chile, I want, you know, uh, onion, I want this. And, and, and you can go out there every day and look out there and say, I want all you want. <laughs> but ain't got nothing, nothing going to happen until you get down and start breaking that ground, pulling out those weeds, and start planting some seeds, my friend. Then you can go out there the next day and the next week, and pretty soon you're going to see a little bit of harvest there, a little thing pop up here and there because you planted not just one seed, a few seeds, all of a sudden you're going to see a harvest. You can't reap what you don't sow. But you'll never sow if you're always looking at your circumstances. You'll never sow if you're always looking at the clouds and the wind and, 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 and my bank account or this or that. Uh, listen, you got, look at verse 6 of the same chapter. He says this, in the morning sow your seed. In the evening sow your seed. And don't withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper. Either this one or that one or both will be good. Hallelujah. In other words, the opposite of, of looking at the clouds and the winds, he's saying, listen, don't hold back. You just sow your seed. Sow it in the morning and sow it in the night because you don't know which one's going to give you the harvest or maybe both of them will give you the harvest. So what is it saying? It's saying, V-O-S-B, learn to sow your ties. And learn to sow your offerings. And learn to sow your pledges. And learn to sow your united we can. And learn to sow into your missionary. Because you don't know which one is going to bring your harvest when you need it. Sometimes you might reap from this one. Another time you might reap from that one. Or you might reap from two of them. Or you might reap from three of them. Sometimes you may reap from all of them. Let me tell you something. When God pours the rain, it pours hallelujah and I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt the reason why I'm a blessed man here today and let me tell you something I've been through some famines I've been through some hard times I've been through the crash I've been through that economic situation but my eyes are not on the circumstance or situation or in this world's economics my eyes are on God my eyes are on the kingdom economics my friend and he has seen me through you know why because I've been faithful to my ties I've been faithful to my offerings I've been faithful to my United We Can. I've been faithful to my pledges. I've been faithful, and therefore God has remained faithful. I don't know how I've made it sometimes through a week. I don't know how I've made it sometimes through a month. I don't know how it happened. And the temptation is always, uh, well, maybe you better hold back. Uh, maybe you better cut it down. No, the devil is a liar. We made a commitment. We said, no, we're going to sow in the famine. We're going to sow in the desert places. And I want you to know that I've seen the glory of God. I've seen the wonders of God's provision. God has always provided for us because I learned to diversify my faith. Oh, hallelujah. I said, you got to learn how to diversify your faith. Just like those investors tell you, diversify your portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket because that one may crash and then there goes all your eggs. But if you diversify, if you spread it around, even though this one crashes, but this one you may reap from a hundredfold. Perfect example there is in Genesis chapter 26. One of the sons of the promise found himself in a famine. Isaac, 
Abraham's son. Remember, God promised Isaac, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And I'm going to make your name great. And you're going to be a blessing to the nations. This is a promise not only to you, but your seed, your children and children's children. And now we see God, we see through the word of God how God blessed Abraham. And how God began to bless Isaac. Isaac found himself in a famine. You read it, Genesis chapter 26. And when all the world, everybody else was saying, we got to get out of here. There's no money here. We can't live here. We can't survive here. Money's, the money's in Egypt. We got to go to Egypt. And all of the world was going to Egypt. But God specifically spoke to Isaac and said, I don't want you to go the way of Egypt. In other words, I don't want you to do what everybody else is doing around you. Because you're mine, beloved. You belong to me. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're mine and I'm your God. He says, you stay right here in this famine. And you sow your seed in this famine. And because Isaac refused to do what the world says, follow the world's philosophy and the world's ideology, but rather follow his theology. He followed his God and was obedient and begin to sow his seed and the Bible says that in one year's time he reaped a hundredfold. Genesis chapter 26, read the chapter. He reaped a hundredfold because of his obedience to the word of God. He passed the test. Therefore Andrew failed, Philip failed the test. Andrew failed the test. Philip failed the test. Now, when I look at Philip and Andrew, and even the little boy, the little lad, when you look at the type of believers that are in the churches today, you'll find that not all, but most are either like Andrew or Philip. In other words, when God begins to challenge you, I want to use your life. I have more for you. I want you to come a little bit closer to me. I want you to make a little bit more deeper commitment. Uh, you have gifts and talents and abilities I put inside of you that have been buried through all these years. And I want to pull it out of you and I want to use your life. Make your life beautiful. When those opportunities come, many times we either fall into one of those conditions of either no faith or some faith. But then we allow doubt, and fear, and unbelief or human reason to suck out our faith. But then there are those others like the little boy. The reason why I say that is because when you look at, the, look at all the people that are here to this morning. The fact is that if we were to give you the percentage of those that are actually using their gifts and service, their time and their talent for the pleasure of God's heart so the church can be edified is only a smaller percentage than the amount is there. Even when it comes to giving, people look at the big crowd and say, well, they must get a lot of money. But the fact is, unless you have grown and matured, in kingdom economics and understand the principles of sowing and reaping, tithes and offerings, giving and receiving, there's only a small percentage that actually carrying the whole load. Of everything that's being done, there's only a small percentage that's actually carrying the whole load. And others are holding back. But if we want to be a church that is, that is on the move, a church that is cutting edge, a church that is making a difference in their community, in their society, in their generation, and around the world. Let me tell you something. We can't hold back. We need every member doing their share, every member doing their part, every member taking a corner, amen, for a crippled man so they can get to church, amen. That speaks of cooperation. Everyone using their gift, using their talent, amen, using their time, not making excuses so the church can grow, the church can be healthy, the church can be edified and be a, an effective body that's making a difference in their generation. Somebody give God a praise and a thank you. Amen. But it takes faith. It takes faith. Faith. 
And even if it's little faith, but it's active. You're using it. You're not looking at what you don't have or what you think you don't have. You look, you're just giving yourself to Jesus and say, Lord, if you can use me, then here I am. Use me, Lord. So when you look at this story, it was a little boy, the little lad that had enough faith to believe that Jesus was able to feed all those 5,000 plus people with a little bit that he gave. And the little bit that he gave became much when he placed it in the master's hands. Did you hear that? The little bit became much when he placed it in the master's hands. Therefore, all those people ate more than enough because of this little boy's faith. And the people went from that, went that day from not having enough to more than enough. The miracle of God's provision. <laughs> See, you'll never experience it. You'll never see it. You'll never encounter it if you're always looking at what you don't have rather than what you do have to give. Or if you're always looking at the winds and the clouds, the circumstances or situations of life, you're never going to see the miraculous of God's provision for your life. Remember that the little that you have can become much. I said the little that you have it's not insignificant. The little that you have can be much when it's placed in the master's hand. Somebody say amen. And when you step out in faith and believe that, you believe that the little that you have, when everybody gives what they have, not look at what they don't, but what they have, the little that you have will become much. And then your not enough will become, and your just enough will become more than enough. Oh, you didn't hear that. I said, when you learn this principle of faith, the little bit that you have, when you place it in the master's hands, amen, will become much. And the, the, the not enough and the just enough where you are now will become more than enough. So that you can do more for God. You can do more for the kingdom because that's the principle of the kingdom. Somebody say amen. So in concluding... As the worship comes, God did a miracle that day through this little boy. Oh, there's a lot of other big churches around. That it's nothing to pick up hundreds of thousands in one Sunday morning. We're not picking up no money, so don't worry about it. Okay? <laughs> We're talking about faith. There, there's, there's, there's places that they can, but I tell you this. I look at us as the little boy. We must be, we're that little lad. And some of us aren't, it? God has blessed many of us. God has, God has taken us beyond what we could ever imagine or dream. But listen, we're not that big of a church yet. But I, we have done a lot. I said, we have made a difference. We have planted many. If we were to hold everybody back, could you imagine how many people we would have? But we're not that kind of ministry. We're a ministry that reaches and teaches and trains and sends. Please, nobody moving around at this time. Please, there's too much moving. We're not, we're not over yet. Have reverence for the Holy Spirit. This is an extreme emergency, I understand, but have reverence for the Holy Spirit. And so, we have to see that it just takes what you have. Like the little boy. That's all he had. Maybe his mom just sent him to the market. Here's a few. Get some bread and get some fish so we can have something to eat for the week or the month or whatever. Maybe the little boy was coming back. I don't know. And then he just happened to see this whole scene there. Hear Jesus asking a question. Where can we buy bread that we, they can eat? And when he's seen... Andrew failed the test, and, and Philip failed the, you know, he said, here, I have. He had the childlike faith to believe. 
And what's interesting to me is that after that, everybody ate. Everybody got filled. He did a miracle that day. Then he says, go pick up what's left. And to their amazement, 12 baskets full. 12 baskets full were left over. Think about it. I don't know about you, but have you ever wondered what happened to those 12 baskets that were left over? I don't know about you, but I choose to believe simply because it's the way God's principles of the kingdom work. After it was collected, I believe Jesus called the little boy over here. Come here, little boy. Because of your faith, here, take it home. <laughs> take it home. So he went home that day, and his mama was probably blown away. Where'd you get all those 12 baskets for? I believe Jesus gave it to the little lad because he's the one that had the faith to give. I don't know about you, but I want our church to be like that little boy. Never intimidated. Never in doubt. Never stuck with human reason or but faith that we can take the world. We can make an impact. We can make VOS be global footprints. I pray that we be that kind of church. It's not afraid or intimidated to give what we have and turn our not enough or just enough into more than enough. Become that base church that is able to feed the hungry and the hurting and the dying world that is out there with the bread of life. Who's the bread of life? Jesus is the bread of life. It's all about Jesus. I said it's all about him. It's not about us. It's not even about our money. It's not so much even about our gift. We give it so that he can use it. That's why he told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I'm going to make your name great because you're going to bless the nations. I want you to stand to your feet here today.